Here at Squadify, we think there's a problem with sport. Of the 32 million people in the UK that play sports on a regular basis, only 3 million are part of a team. Finding a team, maintaining a squad, or even just arranging a game is not always easy. Squadify would like to put that right. Yeah, line, line. Line. We're already organising teams and games from our base in Old Street's Tech Hub. But with investment, we intend to revolutionise the way people meet, communicate and plan their sporting lives. So whatever your sport and whatever your ability, Squadify can match people with the right teams and the right opponents. Find us online or on your phone absolutely free. now and join the revolution. Uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to uh, uh, the Connections Conference for 2012. I think, you know, we live in an ever-changing and complex world. Things are getting faster, things are getting more demanding. Uh, confusing and, dare I say, more exciting. Like many consumer-facing businesses, which sport and recreation sector certainly is, traditional models have been challenged. Challenged by new ways of thinking, new ways of operating and new technology. The business of sport is changing as market entrepreneurs see new opportunities to meet consumer demand. The video you've just seen is an example of that. It's a promotional video that came out uh, last year. Squatify has been described as a stealth mode startup business, planning to, to disrupt the world of casual team sport. UK uh, company aims to make sport more accessible and allow people to find a team rather than a club of their chosen sport at their chosen level, all done through social media. Squatify concept was created by two friends who both moved to London at the same time and found the club structure difficult to navigate, pretty inflexible, too restrictive to meet their urban, new urban lifestyle. So they saw an opportunity. They identified a market demand of people who wanted to play competitive team sport but didn't want to join a club. They found a channel to meet that demand via a low-cost online approach. They believed that the online approach um, was going to break down the barrier for people to actually participate. Squatify is quick and easy, designed to meet the end user, the customer. And I wonder how many of us here in this room could say that our business do the same. Squatify isn't happening in New Zealand yet. And maybe it won't work here because we aren't London and maybe we don't have the scale, but I think we'd be naive to think that there aren't other Squatifies out there. It's a really good example of the innovation and the thinking that's going on in sport and recreation today. All of you in this room, us, represent the formal sport and rec uh, structure in New Zealand. And to some extent, we're doing the same things that we've done the way we've always done it, with the notion of it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I guess in today's world, that's a fairly dangerous mindset. Many of you are running um, a consumer customer facing businesses that involve people paying money for service or an experience. Your customers have choices. They're becoming more discerning, more demanding, and there are more choices. And so I think we're already getting picked off. And I would suggest the growth of the event industry uh, is one really good example. Many of those events now are not owned by national sporting bodies, but by smart entrepreneurs who saw a gap and an opportunity in the marketplace. 
more willing to take a risk, more commercial and outlook, and, the, and as a result, realise profits from piggybacking your sport or recreation activity. I think another good example of that is the fitness industry, the gym industry. These are, I would suggest to you, are the new clubs in our community where consumers, people, are willing to pay large sums of money to join so they can get the experience when they want and how they want. Instead of joining a traditional sports club, many of them are getting that same experience that they would get at that club without the obligations of being involved in that club. We also know we need to understand more about our customers to segment our markets, to understand the various attributes of the likes of the baby boomers, Gen Y and Gen X, what they do, what they want, how do they want to be connected, how they want to be connected with. At last year's conference, we dedicated uh, the, the theme to understanding one of our important market segments, that of young people. I think it was a fantastic conference. We heard directly from young people as we wrestled with understanding their likes, their dislikes, and what motivates them. At last year's conference, we told you about a survey we were conducting on young people. This young people survey is a huge, significant piece of work that we've undertaken, asking over 17,000 young children aged between 5 and 18 about what they think about sport and recreation, what they play, what they like, what they dislike, what turns them off and what turns them on. Now the results of that survey won't be released until later in June, but today I'm able to share a little bit of what we're seeing with some of the preliminary results. It might surprise you to hear that in an age of PlayStations and Xbox, our kids still want to be involved in sport, which is really pleasing. Only about 5% of children said they didn't like playing sport. Despite much anecdotal uh, comment and being exposed to all manner of extreme alternative sports, traditional sports are still really popular, like rugby, netball, football, athletics and swimming, all of those held up very, very well. The data also confirms that children still want to play sport with their friends. Team sport dominates the top 10 sports played by children. As I said to you before, we will be releasing more of that information in June, and I think it's going to make fascinating reading for all of us in the room. I think it'll validate a lot of our current thinking, but it's also going to challenge a lot of our assumptions. As I said, we work in a changing, challenging, complex and exciting times. As leaders, in this room, we're tasked with piling our organisations through this ambiguous world. How do we cope? How do we adjust? How do we adapt? How do we change? How do we innovate to remain competitive and successful? Well, we're going to wrestle with some of those issues and opportunities over the next two days. But maybe we need to look back a wee bit for inspiration and energy, because Kiwis have been known to be great innovators. We need uh, to look no further than a little known gentleman, Mr William Attack, a New Zealander, who in 1884 was credited with designing and, simple and, and, and using the simplest things that transformed the world of social and competitive sport. The whistle came from New Zealand. He was a New Zealand referee, and in 1884 he became the first referee to use a whistle. Until then, until he came along, referees had to raise their voice to control games. I guess there's some out, of the, outs, out, out there today will say there's too much whistle, but it came from a New Zealander. Also, we had a New Zealander as a young boy. Um, he dreamed of a boat that would carry him up New Zealand's swiftly flying rivers. And in 1954, that dream became a reality when uh, William Hamilton designed his first Hamilton jet. Then in 87, Along came a, uh, a, an entrepreneur, an adventurist, a daredevil, an A.J. Hackett. He designed a simple system of plaiting elastic bands together and creating the bungee. And now the bungee is an icon symbol for New Zealand and, and, and our outdoor culture. Arthur Lydiard, another, who revolutionised jogging, introduced it to New Zealand and the world, the method of building up physical fitness by gradually increasing stamina. We have many others the likes of Paul Beckett, who uh, invented the blow cart. We had uh, the um, uh, Aker brothers, who invented the Zorb. And Bruce Farr, who invented uh, the plastic fantastic boat for the America's Cup that changed the face of boat building and high performance yacht racing. 
I could go on. There are many, many New Zealanders who have been incredibly innovative over time. And I think we can certainly look back with some pride, but I guess this conference in lots of ways is about looking forward. So the theme of this conference is innovation. It's about creativity. It's about doing things better. In this context, we're not talking about uh, leading edge or bleeding edge innovation, massive R&D investment and development. The traditional view, I guess, of innovation is that there are special people in special places thinking up special ideas. It's about people wearing baseball caps the wrong way around, elite universities, R&D labs, maybe rooms uh, in, in companies that are painted with funny colours, creating some cr creativity. I think this is the wrong view completely wrong view. What it does is infers that innovation is done by others. Yes, innovation is about breakthrough ideas, but equally it's about borrowing really good ideas and adapting them. It's about being a good copycat. It's about executing things in a superb way. It's about understanding trends and understanding new ways of thinking. It's about understanding the potential of new technology and new business models. It's about learning from other markets here and internationally. It's about learning from each other that notion of creative collaboration. It's about a mindset. It's about a conscious openness to new ideas and new thinking. It's also about understanding what business that we're in, the entertainment business, about what we have to offer, or what's our competitive advantage and who are we competing against, and think about how we can best compete. I think for too long we've talked about our sector as being part of the not-for-profit. I have a problem with that mindset and what that brings. It means we haven't been commercial or entrepreneurial enough. As I explained in the area of events, not only have we just missed the boat, we haven't even seen the boat coming. So over the next two days, uh, we're, not, uh, we're going to challenge you, not about coming up with the next biggest idea, but challenging you to think outside the square to find that better way. I think Squatify shows us there are people outside of what we would consult, call our sector who are doing just that. Like any conference, it's ultimately measured by the quality of the guest speakers. And I'm hugely excited by the array, diversity and quality of the speakers that we have assembled for you in the next two days. Also tonight we have our uh, fourth uh, Sport and Rec Sector Awards. Uh, tonight is unashamedly about celebrating who we are and what we do and what we do so well. I think by any measure 2011 was an absolutely outstanding year across many fronts and we have a lot to celebrate and I know uh, tonight will be a great night. So I'd like to thank you all for investing two days uh, in this, um, of your busy time uh, to come to this conference. I sincerely hope that the conference again uh, meets your expectation. And I guess in recognition of uh, Mr William Attack uh, and the simple common innovation of a whistle, I'll make this the, uh, the open this, uh, this conference. What I'd like to do is to call upon our, um, our, our first uh, guest speaker, um, Michael Henderson. Uh, Michael is a corporate entrepreneur. You'll see all of his bio in the back of your, um, your uh, pack. Uh, he's here today to talk to us about New Zealand culture and hopefully pick up on that theme about how, you know, give us some thoughts on how to release that spirit of innovation that we have in New Zealand. Michael.